Hello everyone, uh, here is our lecture on piano and drums, continuing to round out the rhythm section. Uh, again, if you're not a rhythm section player yourself, teaching the rhythm section can be one of the hardest things for the jazz band. So let's dive into piano and drums. Just to review, we're thinking about a setup something like this. Again, the, the Rick Lawn book, the David Baker book, uh, can give you some different options, but here would be that traditional setup to think about where your drummer is located. Uh, you might want to be careful of your trumpet section here. I've often had uh, second trumpet players complain of the, the noise of the cymbals, depending on how much space is between them and the drummer. Uh, that trumpet player and even the trombone section can be very close to the drummer and the cymbals. It can be uh, some volume issues there. Uh, and again, the bass player uh, next to the drummer is always the best setup. I like this photo. We've seen this one in our, one of our last lectures. Uh, going back to Count Basie is a great example. Here you can see the drums up on a riser. Uh, and sometimes that's helpful uh, both visually for the director, it's help, helpful visually for the audience so they can hear the, uh, uh, they can see what they're hearing. Um, helpful for the bass player, so risers there are part of the setup. All right, let's get into pianists. Some tips for piano. First of all, the style they're playing. Um, you're going to get a lot of piano players in your jazz band that are good pianists. I think most high schools, even middle schools, you can find some students who have been studying piano for a number of years and they may be in some ways more musically advanced than the typical band students who are gonna be filling out much of the jazz band. Um, however, sometimes you've gotta go out of the band room to recruit them. Uh, we even talked about getting your bass players from the orchestra. For piano students, you might need to do a little extra legwork to find pianists. Also, I found in my experience, Often there are some talented pianists who are really good musicians, but they're inexperienced with jazz, and because they're unexperienced with it, uh, they are not real excited about doing it. They need to be convinced that they can do it. Uh, so uh, don't be afraid to go and find a pianist. Go out and convince them that this is something they can do and be successful a lot and that they would enjoy doing it. Uh, and I've had to do a lot of teaching of jazz style. If they're a good pianist, if they have good technique and they can read music well, they'll do great. Uh, you just might need to hold their hands a little bit on some of the style and comping and introduce those concepts a little bit at a time. Um, but I've worked with dozens and dozens of classically trained pianists who've all become uh, fine jazz players uh, just because mostly they were willing to do it. And like I said, they were good musicians. One of the first stylistic things to teach them is to use very little pedal. I often would tell them on a traditional swing tune, don't pedal at all. Just take your foot off the pedal. Um, getting that, that wash of sound, not really appropriate in a, in a up-tempo jazz tune. You're going to see a lot of pianists, you watch videos on YouTube of great jazz pianists, you'll see them tapping their foot, not using the pedal. That might use it a little bit on a ballad, that would be fine, um, but, but very little pedal generally. Also, when they're comping, they're going to be using their hands together a lot. There are some rock and pop styles of piano where you have the bass note in the left hand and the right, uh, the chord in the right hand where you're going boom, check, ba dum, boo, da, ba dum. Uh, that happens in jazz sometimes, but really, uh, if they're comping, they're going to be playing hands together a lot. So I would uh, uh, teach them to avoid that hands apart kind of playing if they're comping. Let's get into comping a little bit more. So the first lesson to teach them is to play jazz rhythms. You might need to give them some rhythms. I'm thinking uh, of a swing style is a good place to start where you might to tell them to go ba da, da da, ba -de da, and then teach them a couple other rhythms to vary it so you get some variety in the rhythms. Uh, but get them to play jazz rhythms. If they want to start with just playing whole notes, that would be an okay place to start too, um, as long as they're hitting hitting the right chords at the right time. Often, I've experienced jazz players that once you teach them to vary their, their comping rhythm, which would be appropriate to do, that they tend to vary it and they tend to play the chords after the chords change, like on the end of one or beat, one, beat two uh, when the chord changed on one. This can be difficult in a band. I found this difficult in a combo when the players, especially younger players, need to hear that chord change. Um, so instead, tell them to always be aware when do the chords change. If it changes on beat one, when it out, put it on beat one. Start your jazz rhythm on beat one and don't syncopate it. Save the syncopations for when a chord continues. Now, tons and tons of exceptions to that. But they need to be aware as a pianist when the chords change uh, and not just improvising the rhythm so much that it doesn't reflect when those chords change. One struggle that I've had 
uh, at every level level of jazz ensemble direction all the way up through college uh, are getting the comping instruments mainly piano and guitar can also include vibraphone or other comping instruments but to get them not to conflict with their comping uh we talked about this in the uh, guitar and bass lecture um if your pianist is improvising their comping rhythm and the guitarist is improvising their comping rhythm chances are they're going to conflict this is where that uh guitar quarter note style the freddie green style where they're just chunking along chunk 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 gives the pianist a lot more freedom to improvise the rhythms. Often you're going to have one of the instruments lay out while the other one does the comping. You don't need two comping instruments at the same time necessarily. If you want to keep them involved, maybe teach them some complementary um, rhythms that they can play that'll, that'll work well together. When in doubt, if it sounds like they're uh, getting in each other's way, they probably are. And the biggest lesson is to teach your pianist and guitarist to be cognizant of what the other is doing. They need to listen and pay attention. They can even watch, since both instruments are very visual. Watch what the other player's hands are doing and make sure that they their uh, own pattern doesn't conflict. For your pianists, if they're uh, comping and they're not playing written out chord voicings, they want to be to the in the middle of the piano to the mid-low range. You don't want to comp too low. Chords down in the bottom of the piano sound real muddy. But you also don't want to get too high. And that's really the common mistake is that you get your pianists comping too high. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples on the next slide where we're on the treble clef staff right at the bottom. That's really about as high as you want to get. You're going to find them kind of straddling the two staffs uh, where they're... they're uh, bottom notes of their chords are in the bass clef and the top notes are at the bottom of the treble clef. They're right there uh, in the heart of the piano range, not going too high. Just like guitar, you want to teach your pianist when they comp to also use rootless voicings. Um, the notes that they're playing are a little bit different. It's this very same concept. The difference is just based on the uh, what's idiomatic on the instruments, what can fit in a piano player's hand versus what fits in the guitar strings. Um, I've got several handouts on Canvas about rootless voicings for piano, but I'm going to explain one in a second here. Uh, but it's the same concept where we want to let the bass player have the freedom to play the root, um, and we don't need to muddy up our chords uh, with the root for the pianists. You only have so many fingers, so if some of those fingers can be playing more interesting tones other than just doubling and tripling the root, um, they can play ninths and elevenths and thirteenths and other really interesting chord tones. And as always, listening is important. Listen to great jazz pianists. Listen to great bands and great combos that have a piano player. Um, you can do this as a director, so you know what to tell your students. You can always encourage your students to do this as well. All right, so here's some example of a rootless piano voicing. I've got C7 here. And here's what it would look like spelled root, third, fifth, and flat seventh. For a lot of piano players, this is a great place to start. For step one, play the right notes at the right time. Uh, getting into rootless piano voicings becomes a more advanced concept. I've worked with uh, pianists at middle school and even high school levels that never got past this. Uh, I've had some college level pianists who were classically trained and uh, it took a little while before they got into rootless piano voicings. Eventually you wanna get them into some more authentic jazz voicings that sound appropriate to the style. But um, this is a fine place to start. When they're ready, when they're comfortable with what's going on, move them beyond that kind of sound into something like this. Here we have it spelled with the flat seventh on the bottom, followed by the ninth, the third, and the fifth. Sounds like this. Now, you probably heard that like I did as a C7 chord, even though we're not playing the note C, we're not playing the root. The reason you probably did hear it that way is uh, because we just heard it in root position a few seconds earlier. If we just pulled this out of the blue, it might be hard to hear that as a C7 chord. You might hear it as a G minor sixth or something other than C7. However, once you put the bass note with it, it's pretty clear that this is a, a pretty nice voicing. You could even move that G up to A, make that a 13th if you wanted to have something hipper. Yes, it is C7, even though we're playing the 9th. Technically, we're playing a C9 chord. It's a dominant 7th chord. Uh, a good piano player is going to add those extra chord tones, even if the composer didn't specifically say C9. If you go to Canvas, like I mentioned before, I've got different handouts on piano voicing. Uh, One-handed 
voicings, which are great for them to play in the left hand when they're improvising with the right, or they could play them in the right hand and uh, play a bass line in the left. And then if they're playing with an ensemble, two-handed voicings, hands together, uh, so they can just accompany, let the bass player do their job uh, and let the uh, an instrumentalist or a soloist uh, do theirs. So let's move on from pianos. Let's talk about drummers. If you are not a drummer yourself, I think this can be one of the hardest parts of teaching a jazz ensemble. So let's dive right on in. Equipment. Drummers uh, playing jazz should use lighter sticks than when they're playing in other styles. When I say other styles, lighter such as lighter than what they would play in a band. That's going to be a 2B or some other sort of stick with a B in the in the name. A uh, lighter stick than they would definitely use a marching band. A lighter stick than they would use in rock drumming on a drum set. 7A is a pretty small stick. When I say small, I mean thin. Uh, gives them a lighter touch and it's dynamically appropriate. Uh, your drummers may be very attached to the sticks that they normally use. I would encourage them to get used to using the right tool for the job. In a plain jazz, it should be a lighter stick. Uh, most of the time, your kick drum is just the drum that you have. It's the, the drum set that your school owns. Or maybe it's the drum set that your drummer owns. And that's uh, you don't have much choice in the matter. However, if you're going to make a purchase for your school, this is where I would recommend a smaller kick, like an 18 or 20-inch kick drum. That would be better for jazz. This gives a more appropriate sound, a little bit more dynamic control, keeps that kick drum from being too heavy. A 22-inch uh, diameter drum would be uh, typical in a rock setting. 20 is a nice uh, jack-of-all-trades size. 18 would be great for combos. Might be a little small for big band. Uh, but an 18 or 20 inch kick in jazz is typical. Again, if you have a choice. So a lot of drummers spend a lot of time practicing styles. When I say a lot of drummers, I mean the good ones. Good drummers spend a lot of time playing different styles. I think this is an underappreciated kind of uh, thing to practice. Practicing their swing feel in uh, both two and four. Uh, practicing bossa nova, practicing a samba. A samba is basically just a bossa nova in cut time. Uh, funk beats, both eighth note based and sixteenth note based. Practicing up tempo swing, um, and all styles in up tempo is is very important too. Even practicing uh, with brushes. Uh, great drummers spend time just like uh, other instrumentalists might shed scales. These are these are scales for, for drum set players. Uh, knowing those different styles, making sure they're authentic and appropriate and versatile. And as always, they should listen to some great players uh, to find out how to do that and make it uh, accurate. Let's talk about drum fills. Generally, in swing styles, drummers are going to fill mainly on the snare drum. Now, the toms can be used as kind of a, an extension of that snare or a contrasting accent or uh, tone in a snare-based fill, but they're going to be snare-based. That kind of dugga 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 round the drum set fill using all the different toms, which is common in a lot of rock styles, not done in swing styles very much in jazz. Just tell them to stay mostly on the snare. Now, when you get into a Latin style, that's where the toms are going to become more helpful, uh, especially those, those higher toms. So it's not about what they like as a drummer. I like to play in the snare. I don't like to play in the snare. I like to use all the drums. Uh, it's about what's appropriate for the style. Generally, the drum fill is going to be louder than the pattern. So uh, some younger drummers tend to get this backwards where they have a really long pattern, really loud pattern, because they're comfortable with that. They've been told to practice those styles. They can play that swing beat really, really well. But the part that they have to read the music on or the part that they have to uh, get out of their, get comfortable in their skin and play a fill for, um, those fills, they're not as comfortable. They play them softer, and those are the parts where we need the accent. That's where we need the drummer to come out of the musical texture. So they need to play those drum fills louder than the rest. Also, teach your drummers to fill when it matters. Uh, some drummers like to play a drum fill uh, as inspiration strikes uh, or whenever they feel like they have a, a good idea for a fill. But really, they should be phrasing. If it's a, a 32 bar A, A, B, A form, the end of the first A in that eighth measure, we should hear some sort of fill setting up the ninth measure, which is the second A. 
maybe even a more prominent fill at the uh, eighth measure of the second A going into that bridge. A little fill at the eighth measure of the B section coming back to the last A. And the most uh, noticeable setup should be at the end of that last A, the last measure or two. This would be measure 31 or 32 of that 32 bar form where we're setting up the next uh, chorus going to the top of the form. They're going to fill when it matters. Um, also filling to set up hits in the band. We'll talk about that in a bit. As always, listen, listen, listen. And when I say listen, I mean twofold. Uh, encourage your students to listen to, if they're a drummer, great drummers. And you, as an instructor, listen to great drummers. Listen to great bands that have great drummers. And how you can learn from that pedagogically. Next, I've got a little list of some common mistakes that drummers make. Uh, and these are things I've picked up along the way in my own experience. I've learned from workshops and master classes. I've learned from great jazz pedagogues. So what are the common mistakes uh, that drummers make? In no particular order, too much kick. Of course, we say kick, we mean the bass drum. We call it kick to uh, avoid confusion with the, uh, uh, the bass part, the bass player. That bass can be too loud. Remember, they may they have that 22-inch kick, and it's uh, it's just too loud. It's too big of a drum. Well, if that's all you have, they've got to learn to play lightly on it. Uh, there's a technique here for using that pedal. Drummers talk about heel up versus heel down. If you imagine practicing that foot pedal for the kick drum, uh, jazz drummers typically use a heel down approach. It gives them more control um, dynamically. Uh, rock drummers often use a heel up approach where they're using just the ball of their foot and their heel doesn't touch the pedal or the ground. Uh, and that can often give them a lot of power, but it sometimes, uh, the, what sacrifices control. So I don't want to get too much into technique of drums. I'm not a drum, uh, teacher, but you might encourage your student to try the heel down technique to get a lighter touch. Now we talk about the kick drum in older styles. Often it was played four on the floor. That's kind of the nickname we have for we're playing quarter notes in every beat where they're just playing do, 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 along with that swing pattern. This was stylistically appropriate. This is often before the bass was amplified. You want to do it light enough that you can hear the bass, but it's just to give some, some fullness to the walking bass line the bass player might be playing um, to give that driving pulse to, to the beat. As jazz got more sophisticated and more complicated in the bebop era, drummers stopped doing that four on the floor. Also, the tempos got faster and it became harder to do. They freed up that right foot on the kick pedal to add accents, drop bombs, so to speak. Ding, 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 boom. Where they would put sort of accents on the, on the kick drum rather than having it be tied down to playing on every quarter note. Whether it's dropping bombs or four on the floor, hopefully that's chosen stylistically. Regardless, it can be too loud. It can just be too too loud for the band. Uh, so a lot of inexperienced drummers play too loud on the kick drum. Tell them to lighten up. Another common mistake, not phrasing with the band. We've mentioned that already. Uh, I saw a great master class uh, with the director of jazz studies at DePaul University in Chicago. And he uh, would take the drum set away from the drummer let the band play, and all the drummer was allowed to have was the ride cymbal and his hi-hat. And he would just be able to go ding, chick, da ding, chick, da ding, chick, da ding. And slowly but surely, the instructor would give him back parts of the drum kit. He'd give him the snare, and he'd let him have the snare if he used it purposefully, intentionally. If he didn't, he took it away. So he couldn't just play the snare somewhere in the middle of the phrase. He had to play a fill at the end of the phrase to set up the next phrase. Uh, and slowly but surely, he would give him parts of the drum kit back when the drummer used them uh, for good, not for evil. Uh, sometimes it can be uh, convenient for a drummer. They want to play something. They want to show off. They want to be active. They want to use something because they can, not because the music calls for them to play the snare at that moment. Um, and that's where not freezing with a band can be a common mistake. One basic drum lesson is every crash cymbal should be accompanied by a snare or a kick. When I say every, I say I really mean almost every. 99% chance. There are exceptions. You can listen to rock music, blues music, country music, jazz music. When they hit a crash cymbal, they're almost always using a snare with it or a kick with it. Now, very rarely are they using all three, a crash, a snare, and a kick together. Um, but I digress. Usually a snare or a kick. So teach your drummers to do that. 
Another common mistake, the fills are just too busy. I've seen a lot of aspiring uh, professional drummers that have a lot of chops, and when they get a chance to put a fill, maybe the director even asks them, hey, in this measure, put in a fill. They try to play every lick. They try to cram in as many notes as possible. Um, sometimes they can. Sometimes they have great abilities to do that. But whether they nail the fill or they worse, they screw it up and, and, and drop the beat, turn over the beat, uh, it doesn't really matter. If it's too busy, it can ruin the moment. I tell my drummers to make the band sound good because if the band sounds good, it must have a great drummer. There's not a jazz band out there that sounds great that has a terrible drummer. So if they make the band sound good, they will look good. If they try to make themselves look good, chances are they may fail. And even if they succeed, the band won't sound good. So tell the drummers to make the band sound good with a simple, effective fill. Play something tasty. It'll work. The band will come in on time for their entrance. Everyone goes home happy because the band sounds great and the drummer sounds great too. Good drummers vary their ride pattern. So if you think of the stereotypical uh, swing pattern on the ride, dang, dang, da dang, dang, da dang, dang, da dang, dang, da dang, it can get real monotonous. And if you listen to great drummers, they don't play that over and over and over again. Yes, that is the basis of their pattern. That's why we teach it to our students. But they have some variety in it. Dang, dang, da dang, dang, da dang, 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 dang. There's a little variety. It's not always a swung dotted eighth sixteenth note on two and four. Sometimes it's on one or three. Sometimes they flip it around, put the sixteenth note first. Da dang, dang. Sometimes they just go back to quarter notes. So I'll tell a drummer if they're varying the ride pattern too far to the complex or not varying it at all and it's become monotonous, I tell them to go back to quarter notes. And they go from dang, dang, da dang, dang, da dang, dang, da dang, to a dang, 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 dang. And if that bass player and his walking bass line, his or her walking bass line, is lining up with that cymbal ping, it really drives the pulse of the band and the band can really swing hard. And I want them to go back to that dang, 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 dang. I tell about the power of dang. It's memorable, it's cheesy, I know, but you'll remember dang. Get your students to go the power of quarter notes. They can be really great to let your uh, make the band swing by varying the ride pattern. Put a few extra quarter notes and a few less of the dotted eight sixteenth. Our last concept, setting up the band. Common mistakes drummers make are not doing that. Uh, we'll talk about what that is in a second. Uh, but this is something that jazz drummers do. They play one, two, or three subdivisions prior to the hit. Okay? So, another common mistake drummers do, they don't set up the band. Let's talk about setting up the band, our last thing to tackle today. This is a little bit more complicated. Good thing to learn so you can speak drummer and communicate with your uh, drummers. Good drummers set up the band by playing one, two, or three subdivisions prior to the hit. Now we say the hit, what do we mean? Maybe it's the jazz band playing a single note all together. Bop. Maybe it's uh, an entrance of the trumpets. Maybe it's something going on in the saxophones. Whatever that moment is, we want to see it happening, hear it happening, in the drums before it happens in the rest of the band. We want to ha almost have musical foreshadowing, if you will. Just a couple of notes, and it sets it up, and it makes it all that more meaningful. So, one, two, or three subdivisions before the hit. If the hit's on beat four, one subdivision is the end of three. One, two, three. Gaga. They're going to play one subdivision before. If it's going to be two subdivisions before that hit on beat four, they might play one, two, three, a four. If it's going to be three subdivisions, they go one, two, a three, a four. Whatever the hit is, they're going to precede it by a few subdivisions, generally eighth notes. Now, why is this hard for jazz drummers? Well, a lot of genres of music don't do this. I've heard some amazing heavy metal drummers, rock drummers, country drummers. It's not a big thing in those genres of music. It happens sometimes. But generally, they're playing with the rest of the band, not with the rest of the band and a few subdivisions before the rest of the band. It's just a different thing, and it's really common in jazz. Let me give you some examples of this. So... Let's say our band has a hit on the end of one. 
I'm going to have two measures of time. When we say that for drums, give me measures of time, we're talking about their pattern. How many measures of that swing pattern, that bossa nova pattern, that samba pattern. Here we're going to be a swing feel. So two measures of time and one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, a one. And that's where that hit is going to be. So here's what it might sound like. The drummer is going to do a crash with the kick and the crash like they should on the hit end of one in the third measure, no setup. So if they were going to set it up with one subdivision before the hit, the hits on the end of one, they're going to do it on the downbeat of one at that third measure. One, two, three, four, got boom. Here's two subdivisions before, the end of four, the downbeat of one, the end of one would be the hit. And three subdivisions before, this would be uh, playing on four and one, then the hit on the end of one. So, setting up the band's important. Help your drummers learn to do that. Uh, you'll be talking to drummers of all levels about this. The really advanced drummers, you might talk about specific ways that can set up a specific hit in a specific song that make most music effectiveness. Uh, beginning drummers, this is a brand new concept. You might have to start from the, from the ground up on this of, of where's the hit, can they play the hit, and then let's proceed it by one, two, or three subdivisions. So, this wraps up our... Uh, lecture on pianos and drummers. Uh, one last thought on drummers. If you go to YouTube and you type in uh, how to teach my jazz drummer or some version of that, you'll find all kinds of videos. You have to separate the ones that are a drum lesson video. If you're not a drummer, you don't need to take jazz drum lessons. But the ones that can give you the pedagogy that are taught by a drummer, they're going to say, here's what drummers are thinking and here's how you as a teacher can help them uh, to think and play that certain way. So hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.